Although we animals are such a bunch of complicated creatures, we are basically made up of just four types of tissue: epithelial tissue, muscular tissue, connective tissue, and nervous tissue. Now, first up is the epithelial tissue. You can think of them as the thin packing or covering material of pretty much everything in our body. So, if you look at yourself in the mirror, most of what you see is epithelial tissue. So, what are they? They are the covering and protecting tissues of our body. Epithelium covers most organs and cavities within the body. It also forms a barrier to keep different body systems separate. so that they can go about their own function without interfering in other organ system functions the skin the lining of the mouth the lining of the blood vessels the lung alveoli kidney tubules all of these are made of epithelial tissue they are again classified based on how many of them are there together that is how many layers are there and how they look now based on how they look they can be just three of them very very simple very very easy they can be like a line they can be like a cube or they can be like a cylinder that's it only the one which looks like a line has a funny name a weird name actually more than funny squamous squamous you must be wondering what on earth were they thinking i was also thinking the same thing but uh, you know i realized that squamous has come from a latin word squama which means the scale of a fish or a serpent and true to the name they look like scales just that they aren't that hard in fact they aren't hard at all they are very 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 soft the other two have very obvious names cuboidal and columnar now if you just put a single layer it's called simple and if you put many layers no it's not called complicated hold on it's called stratified so simple and stratified let's do some permutations and combinations and then you have met every kind of epithelial cells there is to meet Okay, quiz time. What's the first one? I'm sure you'll get this. It's simple squamous, simply because there is one layer of squamous epithelial cells, and this one, simple columnar, single layer columnar cells, and this one, simple cuboidal. So you see where I'm getting? I'm sure you are. Okay, what about this one? There's more than one layer, so it's stratified. What are the type of cells? cuboidal so stratified cuboidal cells next what about this this one is also simple many layers so stratified and type of cells squamous so stratified squamous or squamous stratified and i saved the best one for the last this one is tricky so pay attention this looks neither simple nor stratified some cells are wider at the bottom and narrower at the top while other cells are narrow at the bottom and wider at the top it's like the faking it right they are faking stratified epithelium or they are half stratified epithelium you might have heard the word pseudo before it means misleading or deceptive and that's exactly their name pseudo stratified epithelium and they are found in the lungs and they have some cilia on it they have an awesome name for that too pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells wow okay now that you know how they look you need to understand what they do they all look their different special ways for a reason right so let's understand that simple squamous for example is found in cells lining blood vessels or lung alveoli where transportation of substances has to happen through a permeable surface that is in places where you need a very 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 thin barrier and where else are they found whenever you need a delicate lining the esophagus and the lining of the mouth are also covered with squamous epithelium Now the skin which protects the body so nicely is also made up of squamous epithelium but not one layer of squamous epithelium since your body shed skin yes it does you just cannot see it because the particles are way too small epithelial cells are arranged in many many layers to prevent wear and tear around 600000 particles of skin get shed every hour you logically cannot keep regenerating a single layer of squamous epithelial cells right so here you will have yes you will have stratified squamous epithelial cells so these multiple layers ensure that the skin can withstand normal wear and tear you can actually you know gently very gently scrape the inner side of his cheek stain it and observe it under the microscope you will find stratified squamous epithelial cells okay where would you find cuboidal cells 
in the lining of kidney tubules and ducts of salivary glands where mechanical support becomes important now epithelial cells can graduate further earn themselves another degree and specialize themselves to form glands sometimes a portion of the epithelial tissue folds inward and a multicellular gland is formed this is glandular epithelium now a gland is an organ which just gives out stuff the stuff that it gives out can either be retained inside the body or secreted outside the body like salivary glands where saliva goes out and sweat glands where sweat goes out these are perfect examples of glands which secrete substances outside the body next up muscular tissue when you think muscular you think movement well you also conjure up images of hrithik roshan or arnold schwarzenegger taking care of the bad guys and you're right a hell lot of muscle tissue in your biceps and your triceps will take you closer to the arnold schwarzenegger look now you may already know this it's easier to be happy it takes 17 muscles to smile and 43 to frown unless you're trying to give your face you know a workout smiling is a much easier option for most of us anyone who's ever scowled or frowned for a long period of time knows just how tiresome it is and how it doesn't do anything to actually improve your mood okay so there's something very special about the muscles they contain an exclusive protein which helps in movement these are called contractile proteins these contract and relax and then they cause movement contractile proteins okay muscular tissue comes in three varieties and they have very very obvious names one skeletal muscles so where are they found yes they are attached to the bones of the body or the skeleton of the body now these are muscles that move when you want them to move they help you make a voluntary movement and are called voluntary muscles if i were to skip and jump in front of you it would be completely voluntary though totally weird and is a perfect example of my skeletal muscles in motion in fact you use 200 muscles to take one step that's a lot of work for the muscles considering that most of you take about 10000 steps a day and if you're not taking 10000 at least 10000 steps a day you're spending way too much time in front of the tv or the computer go out and play go on okay so now back to how skeletal muscles look how exactly do they look when you stain them and look at them under the microscope some striations or bands can be seen that's why they're also called striated muscles the cells in the muscles are long cylindrical unbranched and multinucleated multinucleated means having many nuclei that's all once you have a nice meal the movement of food through the digestive tract is the last thing you need to think about right that's because our body is so well designed that it does it on its own so if i am to classify this the example of movement of food down the alimentary canal or say the contraction and relaxation of blood vessels are involuntary the involuntary muscles control their movements they do not show any striations or bands when stained and because of that they are also called unstriated muscles very obvious and very simple names now we cannot stop their movements even if we wanted to so the iris of the eye and the bronchi in the lungs all have unstriated muscles looks like scientists loved giving them different names based on how they look they look smooth and spindle like with a single nucleus they are also called smooth muscles and the last type the movement which keeps you alive the cardiac muscle and i'm sure you have already guessed where it's found yes in the heart the muscles of the heart show a nice rhythmic movement of contraction and relaxation throughout our life and how do they look they're cylindrical branched and they have a single nucleus they look a lot like striated muscles it's just that they have these little intercalated discs that is going to transfer electrical impulses through the heart causing these contractions to happen so if i were to put these three types side by side what do i see voluntary muscles also called skeletal muscles long cylindrical unbranched and multi nucleate and then i have involuntary muscles of two types one smooth muscles that are long with pointed ends spindle shaped and they have a single nucleus and cardiac muscles that are branched cylindrical and again with a single nucleus now here's a little pop quiz question for you which is the strongest muscle in the body i don't think you would have guessed this it's the tongue yes the tongue while you may actually not be able to bench press too much with your tongue it is in fact the strongest muscle in your body in proportion to its size if you think about it every time you eat swallow talk you use your tongue right 
ensuring that it gets quite a big workout throughout the day. Okay, connective tissue and as the name suggests, it has something to do with connections and is a part of all connecting substances of our body like bones, blood and fat. And what exactly makes blood red? The fluid part of blood, the matrix is actually colorless and it's called plasma. Plasma contains proteins, salts and hormones. So in this plasma, you have some red blood cells, what we call RBCs white blood cells, WBCs, and platelets floating around. And it's the RBCs, as you guessed, which give the blood the distinctive red color. And again, it's a substance called hemoglobin inside the RBC, which causes it to be red. So what is the most important function of blood? Transportation. Yes, but transportation of what? Oxygen. Oxygen that drives every single cell in your body. The hemoglobin in your RBC carries oxygen and supplies it to every cell in your body. And you know what? Your brain uses 20% of that oxygen which enters your bloodstream. The brain only makes up 2% of our body mass, yet consumes more oxygen than any other organ in the body, making it extremely susceptible to damage related to oxygen deprivation. So breathe deep to keep your brain happy and swimming in oxygenated cells. Now the heart the muscle man of the circulatory system, let's take our memory back to cardiac muscle, pumps the blood all through the body. Blood just cannot flow because of gravitation, you know. In fact, the human heart, you know, creates that much pressure, enough pressure to squirt blood an astounding 30 feet. Uh, there used to be a medieval misbelief that aristocratic blood was blue. It's of a Spanish origin, sangria yule, which means of blue blood and was used to refer to someone of very high rank and birth. And let's keep the suspense going. I'm going to let you find out why. Why is it that royal families are said to have or said to have believed to have blue blood? Our blood is red for sure because of the iron content in the hemoglobin that I spoke about just now. There are some blue blooded creatures, spiders and crabs make for good, make for good examples. They have something similar to blood. It's called hemolymph. And there is a copper-based pigment in that which makes it blue. What about white blood cells? Typically used in defense to protect our body against foreign invaders. No, they're not going to dish out a sword and armor from your body and get you war ready. I am talking about invaders at a microscopic level. Viruses, parasites, the ones that aren't really supposed to be in our body but are there. We need to get rid of them real fast and the WBCs actually help you do that. Now, platelets are found only in mammals and they help in the clotting of blood. So, three major blood types, RBCs, WBCs, platelets all swimming around happily in the plasma. The next type of connective tissue that you should know about is the bone. The framework that supports the body and forms the most valuable archaeological finds due to which we're able to find out so many evolutionary relationships and answer some critical questions like, where we exactly came from. One interesting fact about bones is that you are born with more bones than when you die. Yes, really. Babies are born with 300 bones, but by the time you reach adulthood, the number is reduced to 206. That's because some bones fuse together as you get older. And your feet account for one quarter of all your body's bones. You may not really give your feet much thought, but they are home to more bones than any other part of your body. So how many exactly? Of the 200 or so bones in the body, of the 206 bones in the body, the feet contain a whooping 52. Now bones come in a very hard matrix made up of calcium and phosphorus. You must have seen all these calcium supplements, right? That is for strengthening your bones. Now two bones can be connected to each other by another type of connective tissue called the ligament. When you run and twist your ankle, a minor injury that could happen to you is a ligament tear. A major injury would be a fracture. Now that's where there's a crack in your bone and if you ever had it, you'll know it. It's very, very painful. The ligament is very elastic with very little matrix. And then you have tendons which connect muscles to bones. They are filled with fibers and not that elastic. Okay, so to summarize, Ligament is bone to bone and tendon is muscle to bone. So ligaments and tendons, two important type of connections. 
cartilage is found in your nose and your ears. Try twisting them a bit and you can see that this is actually possible. However, you cannot bend the bones in your arms or legs. Both are types of connective tissue, but see how different they are. And how does it look? It has some widely spaced cells and a solid matrix embedded with proteins and sugars. Now let's talk about some of the softer connective tissues. The tissue that connects the skin and the muscle all around the blood vessels and in the bone marrow. The bone marrow fills up the hollow part of the bone. It's a little bit airier, if I'm allowed to use that word, compared to bone and tendon and this ligament is called areolar tissue. This tissue is like a medical emergency kit as well and helps in the repair of damaged tissues. Another soft tissue that you would read about or learn about is the fat tissue or the adipose tissue that does all the cushioning and in some cases the extra cushioning of our body. And where is this found? This is easy between the skin and the internal organs. The cells of this tissue are filled with fat globules and this also will serve as an insulator. So you have blood cells, bone, ligament, tendons, areolar tissue, adipose tissue, all unique, all special, all important and all different types of connective tissue. And we made our journey to the last tissue, the nervous tissue. It comes together to form nervous system of the body, whose main components are the big boss, the brain and the spinal cord. So what exactly does the nervous system do? It takes all important decisions for you about what the body should do, how it should look like and so on and so on. And since this is such an important system, you would have guessed that the cells in the system would be super special too. And you are right. The nervous tissue is comprised of very, very special cells called neurons and glial cells. Now the work of the nervous system is to one, send stimuli like touch, smell, taste, sight and hearing and two, send impulses across the body through electrical signals. Now, neurons look like typical cells with a cell body and a nucleus. Now, this is an important diagram from an exam point of view and we'll make it very easy. If you ask me for an analogy, as you can see, it looks something like a tree with branches, the trunk and the roots. The branches are the dendrites, the trunk is the axon and the roots are called the axon terminals. You heard that word before, right? What exactly happens in a train or a bus terminal? Trains or buses come in and go out. Similarly, at the axon terminals, important information through electrical impulses transferred from one neuron to the other. They actually high jump across from one neuron to the other through the small space called the synapse. For glial cells, they aren't as famous as neurons, right? In fact, all the attention is stolen by the nerve cells. No one even talks about glia, that is plural for glial cells. But the fact is that there are 10 to 50 times more glial cells in our body than nerve cells. But neurons cannot even function properly without the glial cells. They are the personal secretaries of the neuron and do a lot of chores for the neurons. They hang around in bunches all around the nerve cells. In Greek, actually, glia means glue, the glue of the nervous system although only this is partially accurate. They do surround the neurons and support them, but along with that, they supply nutrients and oxygen to the neurons. They insulate one neuron from the other and they also destroy pathogens and help in protecting these neurons. Many nerve fibers bundle up together with the connective tissue and make up a nerve. The nerve impulses generated allow us to actually move our muscles. So this nice, neat interplay of nervous and muscular tissue is fundamental to movement. You can clearly see how different tissues come together in such perfect coordination to give you the gift of life.